Well, making a welcome return <laughs> to the show <laughs> all the way from Perth in Western Australia, Alex Lasku, welcome back. Why, thank you. It's nice to be back. It's been long <laughs> enough, I think. <laughs> Way too long, way too long, and I even, <laughs> I even teased you with several, um, several reconfigured calls that we, I had to cancel because of the scheduling, like <laughs> I'm having all the time. So, uh, once again, thank you for your patience. No, I mean this is what almost exactly a year after we met face to face, pretty uh, much for yeah, the indeed. first time I think when I was uh, in England. Yeah, everything last year, in so. sport women's edition. I remember that was good, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Right. So uh, what's going on in your world? Well, actually, before we jump into that, some people might be new to the show. They haven't heard the previous episode because they haven't gone through the entire back catalogue yet. So if you wouldn't mind giving people a bit of a lowdown on your your journey in this world we operate in, you're pretty prolific. So most people will know of you, but some may not. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't expect them to know of me, so it's perfectly fine if you don't. Um, yeah, I mean, I must be early in the archives after the, the first time I came on. Um, our first chat was very much around how the brain is not a computer. I still actually use that metaphor a lot in terms of the way that we process information and interact with the world. Um, I guess you'd call me a, a skill acquisition specialist, so I, I still operate in the space between as many sports as I can get my hands on. Um, one of my favourite things is just learning from unique contexts and the people that find themselves in them. So I try to collect as many different sports as I can and still try to play as many different sports as I can to, to remember what it feels like to be a beginner. Um, I primarily operate in coach education and development now, which has been incredible fun. I never thought I'd actually work for the sport that I dedicated my life to, but to be in this role after 20 seasons of playing cricket and now finally getting to support the coaches um, that are just out there doing their best is my happy place. Um, I spent most of my PhD in skill acquisition talking about how community coaches are the downfall of why we don't have a lot of the skill development and join through movement uh, because they're just unsupported and now it's literally my job to support them so I'm um, really enjoying the space and, and just trying my best to make sure that um, we take all of the lessons and learnings along the way but we also recognize what people already do know and meeting them in the middle Liam there's lots happening you're <laughs> you're well known for not just because you obviously spent some time doing your PhD, working in the academic field, um, writing articles and papers, but you're well known or fairly well known, I'd say, for not just leaving the insight in journals that can be a bit impenetrable for the average person or community coach or whatever it might be, but actually translating that and using you know, kind of digital media as a mechanism to convey some of those ideas, either through this medium, podcasting or videos or conversations or or likewise. Um, mm. Just before I usually do this at the end, but it's probably worth just reflecting on where you place some of this stuff, because you've got a number of different channels. And again, I've lost track of it. You probably created a new one since we last spoke. <laughs> I try not to make too many now, but it is very much responding on what people want, right? So a big thing for me is I draw mind maps. Um, I actually have my iPad open right now just in case anything good pops up. But yeah, a lot of my mind maps are posted either on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, More recently, though, I found that people are looking for quality video content. And one of the hard things about where we operate is that a lot of the content is just not palatable for normal people. There is almost like this wall that you have to scale before you can even begin to drop into a lot of this content. Um, And a lot of the research, as you say, is just locked away and impenetrable. Um, So creating more YouTube videos, like being more active on things like Instagram, where people just accidentally stumble upon your content rather than intentionally going out looking for it um, is a space that I've more recently started to enjoy, especially because there's so much misinformation. If anything, I spend so much time sitting on social media going, oh my God, people believe this. Or like they just said it with such conviction that of course they're going to believe this. They're never going to dig deeper into where this comes from. Um, So spending more time on Instagram and things like that, trying to just combat 
um, the misinformation that's out there and, and how easy it is to stumble upon. I, I figured if I uh, had an attempt of maybe being also accessible to stumble upon, we might actually get somewhere in those spaces. Right. And um, where can people find you on Instagram? I have to admit, it's a medium that I don't tend to utilize myself because obviously I'm old. But, you know, you youthful types, <laughs> this is where you live, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, I'll never download TikTok, but I will maintain my Instagram. Uh, yeah, at Skillac Lasku is, is where I find all my sport, sport content. i um, been posting a lot more videos and stuff lately around. And uh, my YouTube channel is, is the same. Um, trying to be more consistent across the tag so that people can find me wherever they go. But um, yeah, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all the same handle, all me just talking sport nerdy stuff. <laughs> That'll be S K I double L A Q L A S C U, correct? Uh, A C Q, yeah. A C Q. Oh, okay. All right, got it. Right, <laughs> um, right. So one of the reasons we, we are coming together is to talk all things coach education and development, which is obviously your operation, because you, you, your interest was piqued by my latest Dog Walk Diary series called Coach Education is Broken. So I'm happy to jump. This is almost a bit of a reverse podcast because I guess you're going to ask me stuff and I'm, we're just going to riff and have that general conversation about all the things that are in there. But I'm happy for you mm -hmm. to create the starting point. Yeah, well, I'm more than happy to. I think one of the biggest things is how did you come to that logical flow of the episodes? I quite liked how we went from, you know, transformation, not transaction, to changing the paradigm, to qualifications and professional recognition. It kind of all flows and it was quite logical. Is that something that you had planned before or the second you start talking, it starts to kind of fall out and you're like, oh, these things are very tightly connected. So, um. So just to sort of explain where they all came from, um, I'm still in the middle, actually. We've got two to go, but um, there's seven in total, and there may even be more than that as we go forward. But mm. um, where they came from was, this is where the sort of day job and the and the kind of my outside world of not not working in kind of in the in the industry, so to speak. But one of the things we did we did we in looking to create a new. Uh, blueprint, which we, we call it a blueprint, and it's deliberately designed to be a blueprint because it doesn't mandate anything. It's not, and it's also not necessarily about, you know, a list of things or things. It's about, I guess, creating a schematic for the creation of a new coach education and development ecosystem. Mm. And in 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 the design of such or in the creation of such a thing. Obviously, it's incumbent upon us, and this will obviously resonate with you, to effectively engage with uh, stakeholders. So in the main, it's you know the people on the receiving end, so practitioners, coaches, group exercise instructors, personal trainers. You know, we're walking across the sports landscape, sport and physical activity landscape, mm -hmm. not just necessarily in the community sport channel or performance sport channels. And traditionally, you know, what would happen is, you know, you'd normally be, it'd be the needs of performance would then be sort of mandated into participation and didn't always fit. And we've clearly seen some really quite high profile uh, impacts of taking such a, an approach. Um, so like that, so when you're listening to people and you're in listening mode and you're in full engagement mode, you know, and then what you then do is you go through a process of synthesis now, I won't say all of this was done purely by that process. It's actually also to do with, you know, I'm very fortunate that in this role, as in as a podcaster and to a certain extent, you know, a, I guess a, a personality within the space of coach development, uh, you know, I'm asked to speak and I run workshops and I do a lot of development and I speak at conferences and I, I, I'm doing a lot of listening. I speak to a lot of practitioners and a lot of, people who support them you know system builders you could call them if you like so it's a combination of that piece of work combined with you know kind of a, a i guess a synthesis of some experiences that have formed a worldview around where coach education might need to might need to move and you combine that mm -hmm. then with some of the ecological literature combine that with uh kind of alternative uh, models around learning 
and acquisition of skill, coaching skill in this case, but new models of learning that would go alongside that, uh, and 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 a movement in the what you might call the adult learning space around particularly you know towards more experiential learning models rather than the sort of theoretical ones and you you aggregate that together and then you know you kind of form this and then your problem is is that right well how do you convey that in a relatively simple and coherent messaging framework that people would be able to grab hold of and utilize as a mechanism to bring about internal system change so the idea being is that the system shift are what people are calling for it's supposed to be a uh, um, a representation of what people are calling for in a range of contexts. Uh, and they're designed to be uh, a different way of thinking or a way to challenge thinking because one of my experiences has been uh, in the last however many years of working in this space is that I think one of the biggest rate limiters to genuine transformation in coach education are is the people within the system designing the system who are and i'm not blaming them by the way because there's an awful lot of constraining um artifacts and uh i guess in many ways not just even artifacts like proper systemic kind of barriers or infrastructure that does need to be dismantled in order to think differently but they're very constrained by some of that they're constrained by popular culture and expectation they're constrained by uh, some, you know, kind of different ideas around things like qualification and all that sort of stuff. So I guess the system shifts are a way of articulating a, a vision of the future, one where practitioners are not seen as a means to an end and looked over whilst we search for the participants and try to grow sports or develop skills and develop capabilities for performance at performance, but one where the practitioner is seen as a genuine um you know, kind of part of the sport ecosystem with value, not not hidden in plain sight. You know, they're genuinely there as, a, as you know, if it's, you don't just give them some training to get them to do a job. You treat them as, as, as really valuable participants in the sports experience. And in so doing, they then are then better equipped to provide experiences to others that we hope will lead to growth in participation and all the other potential goods that's come with sport and physical activity. Um, yeah, so that's the synthesis. Now, the I'll be totally honest with you, the logical framing, I'm glad you said it's a logical framing. Um, I don't think there was necessarily a great deal in that. It's just they they, they seem to flow, but it, I didn't necessarily design it like that. I guess it's probably how my brain works, that there's a flow, <laughs> but it wasn't a specific thing I was doing. It was just these are seven things, I think probably we need to consider and like i said it's not exhaustive i'll probably add to it as we go along but for now seven mm -hmm. system shifts has a nice alliteration so we'll go with that for now <laughs> yeah, i know that means a lot to you something that sounds <laughs> as, just as catchy <laughs> as it looks but i i do think and i find myself i always find podcasts really difficult and i've never understood the people who can listen to podcasts in cars because i always have to take notes during podcasts and yeah. so i can never I sometimes will go for a walk and i will look like that dingy millennial who's addicted to their phone because i will be constantly typing out notes as i'm listening but i do think every time we hear those words out loud every time there is just another knock at the door of hey you could do this differently it does actually make a difference and, and seeing them sort of fall out in that order um, made it a lot easier for me to think about okay well how many of these do we actually need to change in my own context what am I seeing as the things that are ready to move and the things that are maybe still in super glue you know dug down I often use like a, a Jenga analogy nowadays of we've spent so much time just like pulling all the blocks out thinking that they needed to move and kicking the tower over in the process and that tower being an actual functioning human being who's just trying to do their best and we're literally driving them out of the system because we're not paying attention to what what they need to instead kind of just tapping the tower and seeing which blocks are ready to move and be like can you can move that one like wanna want to do that together um and to create like the conversations that actually start the systemic shifts like uh, definitely there are days where I feel like I'm banging my head on a wall not because anyone's doing anything wrong but because half the time it's an expectation of what people think we should be doing in this space who said 
what you hated your education experience as a child you want me to recreate that is that what you're expecting right now oh well I'm sorry to disappoint you but I'm not going to do that first of all because I'm not the font of all knowledge so uh, I'm not standing at the front of the classroom we're going to go outside because that is the context that you work in I love that Jenga analogy that's a really great (laughs) metaphor the idea of yeah we're not just going to push it at all and it all falls down and then you're left with nothing and you've got to rebuild it you push at the ones that are the loosest that are ready to shift shift those and in so doing we create a different a different shaped tower love that concept it's it's just destabilization really and like it makes sense nobody wants to feel entirely untethered or unstable of course we're going to be able to do maybe one or two if we're lucky things that will take them out of their comfort zones or their their sphere of expectations but realistically I can only really get away with one big systemic change what a year a season maybe a month if I'm lucky and people are ready to buy into it but we're at a stage now where we're just trying to convince people that ongoing learning and development is good for your own sake not just for the sake of your participants but aren't you bored like I would hate if someone came up to me and go wow you're exactly the same coach that I saw five years ago I hope not. <laughs> I've learned a lot in that time. Thank you very much. A lot of what not to do primarily, um, how not to make eight-year-old girls cry, I hope, but uh, through trial and error more so than anything else. But I do think there are so many people who are just the exact same coach they were when they started or when their kids started a sport because they've not turned to an organization and thought, wow, these people can really help me, even though that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I love the, I mean, obviously the metaphor of Jenga is one related to play and games, which we love. So we, we I love mm-hmm. that. It, interestingly, you made me reflect a little bit that um, I suppose you could think this think of the system. So your point about you can do one a year or so. Um, one of the interesting things about this particular framework and framework for change is as you do this sort of stuff, you begin to realize that you almost you you can't do one without doing many of the others so it's it's yeah. not it's not a linear process of change because I, it's almost like it's um what's the word uh it's almost like it's um working outwards from a spiral in the middle you know like a, almost like a ripple mm. effect to a certain extent but it um i'm trying to think of the model of learning that they refer to that as it'll come back to me in a minute but it's like a cyclical process because for example you want to move away from <clears throat> qualified once competent forever so the idea that mm. qualification is a proxy for expertise and the fact that i did some kind of a learning experience that created some form of assessment which then certified me at a moment in time is going to last forever mm. and i'm going to be able to inhabit that and actually like you say if you as an individual you in f- over five years go through quite considerable growth as a coach it'd be great, wouldn't it, for somebody to be able to recognize that and go, actually, you really have developed and grown. And and I want to be able to put some kind of a a badge or a a recognition mechanism around you to say, actually, that that's really cool, right? What you've done there, your your commitment to your practice, whether it's experientially driven or it's through additional formal learning or whatever resources that you use, and that's transport, that transformed you as a practitioner and therefore you're providing an enhanced experience for whoever it is you're working with to recognize that i think is a really powerful motivational force and one that those who do commit should deserve but the problem you have is qualification is such a blunt instrument because it doesn't differentiate from those who did that and then did nothing and those who did that and then really committed to their ongoing development. So the real, so the motivation for development is pretty low amongst mm. practitioners because, well, why does it advance? What advantage does it bestow on me? Now, in an ideal meritocratic world, you would hope, wouldn't you, that those who do commit are the ones who are going to get the opportunities later, you know, whether they want to get, you know, in, somewhere in the pathway or whatever it might be. But it doesn't work like that necessarily because <laughs> life isn't fair. Mm-hmm. And and so this recognition mechanism is a really important aspect to move beyond that. So just to extend the metaphor around Jenga, it's almost like they're dominoes <clears throat> in many mm-hmm. ways. 
and but they they're not dominoes that you you push and one topples the next topples the next topples the next yes that does work but it's almost like one of those amazing domino things you know where you press one domino and then all of a sudden this picture appears like a mosaic because they all go off on different routes it's more like that mm -hmm. yeah and i do think we haven't really stepped back to think about what that mosaic should look like and it's not and that's one of the hard things right it's like you don't want to predetermine what somebody's learning should be because we don't actually know enough about those people yet and they don't trust us to tell us yet either we're still building those relationships over time because the education system hasn't been an enjoyable experience so why would they come and tell us what they need if it hasn't serviced them in the past but at the same time if we have absolutely no plan whatsoever or no oversight of what we could lead them towards what that progress could look like or how do we move closer to something that actually does maximize the participants experience then we are just kicking over dominoes for the sake of it and they're not connected to anything so I think a lot of people struggle with you know prepared but not planned is probably something that I've just embedded in literally every coach education person in cricket in Australia I've heard it quoted a few times now and I'm so glad that it's caught on um, but even just that notion is like well no we still have a plan I promise there is a plan somewhere but I'm not telling you in what order to do it or what it should look like I'm prepared to give you the next thing that you need exactly when you need it and all of that information exists somewhere it's there but I'm only prepared enough to make sure that I pay attention to what you need and then service it in that way and yes it is going to be probably the extent of my time in Lou <laughs> will be maxed out this season but I think it's still so worth it for someone who has the energy to genuinely go out there and do it um, while we can and yeah I think it's just so much easier to kick over a domino and just hope that it that actually creates something no one's really stepping back to see okay well how do we actually put these in place so when when someone does get that momentum when they do get that first taste of oh I could be better at that not because someone else told me to but because I want to be then I don't think we we actually reward that you know initiative enough no exactly yeah and and that's the thing I think that you know over the years that I've heard you know and I find still quite fascinating that we haven't moved from this. I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that we don't need some form of qualification. What I'm, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is how somebody obtains that is would be very, very different. So I think mm -hmm. in, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but I tell the story of, um, of Carol, who's one of the coaches at my club. He hasn't done a qualification. Yeah, at the recreational level. Yeah. Yeah. Working with, you know, the, the women's third and fourth team and doing things like, you know, back to hockey and, you know, really great at that. And um, loads of people playing and, you know, we see great, you know, as a as a chair of that club, you know, it's really good membership growth as a result of that. You know, it's brilliant. Um, mm. And um, and actually, funnily enough, we sort of stopped doing some of that stuff, partly because of not having the right people in place to run those activities seen a decline in numbers and now we're facing potentially having to drop a team so it's interesting how you know we these things need to be really thought through and a lot of people one of the things I'm astounded by before I became a chair of a community club is how few people on the kind of governing group and we call it a committee but you know I now call it the leadership team um, how many people in that group they never really gave any thought to who was leading the activities for the members I really didn't I didn't think that it was like, oh, well, anyone's as good as anyone, really, as long as there's someone. Well, no, no, no. Mm. Like, so um, uh, anyway, the reason I'm saying that is because when you talk about Carol, you know, she mm. clearly had stuff, right? It's pretty intangible. It's difficult necessarily to grasp mm. what it was because it certainly wasn't anything necessarily technical. Um, You know, I think she had a degree of technical knowledge, but she wasn't the strongest necessarily. It wasn't like she was, you know, kind of high flying player. So massively disabuses the notion that you have to be a high level uh, participant in order to be a practitioner as a coach. That clearly disabuses of that notion, but had other qualities uh, that was recognized by a developer who was working in situ, who said, "I if I had the mechanism, the world needs more people like Carol. And if I had the mechanism, I would give her this certification. 
a recognition mm. of her expertise, as opposed to this idea that you need to have gone and done the learning thing that we've designed in order mm. for us to ordain you as uh, appropriate for action. And I think this, so this idea altogether that, you know, we must have obtained some form of, we must go through this formal learning experience that's designed by some sort of authority organization uh, in order for an individual to be deemed suitable or appropriate to practice. I think just got to turn it on its head because actually we're missing out on so many great people because of the yeah. limitations and the barriers for them to engage. Yeah. And I, we do joke a bit, like, especially now I'm not used to being in like a position of power. <laughs> so I'm definitely trying to see how far we can take it. But uh, my catchphrase more recently is to accredit a conversation and people mm, think nice. I'm kidding, but I'm, I'm not. Um, all of our coaching courses are free. So there is no prior learning or experience that you have to do. There aren't even realistically online modules that you have to complete. When you attend a coaching course and we try to run as many as possible throughout the season, it is a three hour time commitment and it's out of context. So I, even I'm not the biggest fan of that, you know, placement, but that's what people expect from a coaching course. So it's not like we can take those away immediately. So I've been playing more of the improv. Yes. And. Well, what else can we do around these coaching courses? If this is what people think coach learning is, great, we'll provide those, but we'll also go the other way and go and visit them in their own context. What if we just take the learning to them? What if we do a follow-up session? What if we let people request a follow-up session so that when they do a course and they tick yes at the end, they get personalized one-on-one -on -one development for a night for somebody, a member of staff. You get that feeling of someone in the polo coming down to your training session and coaching alongside you, guiding you through that moment, not predictating what it should look like or what you're doing wrong and you know, holding a checklist and saying whether or not you've passed those competencies. I'm sorry. The only competency that matters is like how much laughter is happening at an under 10 session to me. Like if, if I could actually put that on the checklist. I'll tick off any time I hear laughter. Great, you're a community cricket coach. And so if we're already having as low a bar as possible to get people into their coaching journey, why don't we accredit those conversations? Anyone who can go to a course like that or not, or even just walk into coaching for the first time and say, I don't think this is activity is actually achieving what we tried to do, but I'm going to go ask them real quick. And then we're going to co-design like how we adjust this activity to get back on track to what they wanted to learn today. I'll give you a level three coaching qualification for that level of reflexivity, but I can't do, but that conversation alone shows more reflection, more depth, more intentionality than any coaching course is ever going to teach you, regardless of how well we design those formalized education offerings. So yes, you are now officially a community cricket coach accredited because you had that conversation with me. Why, why can't we do that? Can't, can't we do that? If we're the ones designing the courses and we're the ones ticking off the participants, ultimately I can say that was a course, me attending your training session and every coach I spoke to in that context has just officially done a community accreditation. Congratulations. Like I just don't, when their actual outcomes and behaviors are better from those interactions than any course that you can sign up for. Why don't we actually just move to the point where that is an equal learning opportunity systemically um, as anything else? Yeah, I mean, that, that's perfect. That's exactly what we're talking about. But I've got some interesting questions I'm going to ask you because these mm. are the questions I get asked. Um, I bet. <laughs> so working alongside a coach or group of coaches in their context mm. with them and learning together and then reflecting on our experiences and having a you could call it a professional discussion if you like but we could just have a mm -hmm. you know a, a, con, a you know an open community of learning style conversation about our experiences uh all well and good but you're working across significant geography and scale mm -hmm. so how do you mm -hmm. do that at scale Mm -hmm. so we may, have, we may not have the answers to this by the way we can co-create them together but let's talk about that exactly 
No, I, I'm more than happy to. I, I love these kind of conversations to see where our actual roadblocks are or where the systemic um, issues might come. But we're really lucky in that we have uh, amazing staff in every regional area. So, and, and that's probably one of the benefits of working for such a, a organization that's actually committed genuinely to community sport in that we made everybody go through a coach developer training this year. When we had the opportunity to do a roadshow um, where our national governing body came along and actually provided us with upskilling and training. Um, we took that very seriously and every single person in the department, including the specialist areas who don't actually work directly with coaches, all did the same level of coach developer training. So there is not a single person in that office that I would worry if a coach ever came up to them and asked them a question. I know that their line of questioning and the potential answers that might fall out of that conversation are probably exactly what I would think of as well. And if anything, they might be better because they're closer to that context. They're hopefully working with those stakeholders more closely than I can because that is their role. I'm only in charge of learning and development. I don't actually get to do the site visits as often as some others. So regionally, I'm really happy with the way that we have dedicated our staff and our own learning and development as staff members to make sure that anyone can have those conversations. So that helps. Um, and in terms of scale, like because we're at the point now where we're working through a new national coach development framework, um, we've actually decided that our most important stakeholders are the ones that don't know any better. So instead of trying to service everybody in exactly the same way at exactly the same time, um, we wanted to prioritize the people who are new to cricket because that is, it's easily one of the most intimidating sports. People apologize to me for not knowing cricket, which I think is just sad. Like you shouldn't have to apologize for not knowing a sport. I, I should apologize for not remembering the positions of basketball. Like I'd be, I'd be screwed if I had to apologize for every sport I don't know the mechanics of. Um, so targeting every single community coach that is brand new or at the first stage of learning. So for us, that's sort of like under 10s to under 13s. Um, those are the coaches that we are going hard and fast at to make sure that their first experience of coaching, just like an athlete, is not isolated, is not unsupported, and is not feeling like you have no idea what to do next. And then we can scale up from there. I think a lot of the the people who are working in the higher stages with older children in particular, of course, their learning needs are different. So we can tackle those in different contexts. We can bring them together and probably have richer discussions because their challenges and problems are, are quite complex and having the space to talk about them might be more beneficial than someone who genuinely just doesn't know how to set up the wickets on the weekend or how far the pitch is or how long the boundaries are. Um, so trying to make sure that we actually provide more tailored support to the beginners, to the people who are just starting their coaching journey has allowed us to kind of target um, who needs that support to start with. And then we can scale that not in the, in the way of like spending the same amount of time in the same amount of context, but um, actually redesigning it for the existing coaches. So it is more suitable to what they need from them. Um, and building those connections within clubs, there's going to be a big piece for us. I would really love to have just, one person who loves coaching as the first touch point in every club and just their job is just to tap someone on the shoulder or at training and be like, Hey, how are you doing? That's it. That's your job <laughs> as the coaching champion is to ask how another coach is doing. That's it. Job done. So, you, you, so as you move forward, your goal would be to, you've got what well, clearly you've already got, you've got staff that are, Mm -hmm. now more equipped to be able to support coaches on the ground, recognizing the value of that workforce. You're targeted in terms of, yeah, we're not going to try and be all things to all people. We're going to focus a little bit on a particular mm -hmm. priority group and we're going to give them the support that they need because we know that that's going to be an acute, acute need there and probably where you see the most drop off, I guess. Um, mm. And then, and then on, and, and, order, and to augment that, identify and support people within the club environment to do the that pastoral support as well because they've got some qualities that you can identify. So there's that sort of informal peer-to-peer -peer support combined with more slightly, you know, semi-formal relationship with a staffing, you know, like the, the polo shirt, like you say, who can come in and give that <laughs> sort of verification. Okay, so that, mm. that's good. Now, one thing that's interesting is, is that I, I one of the things I hear a lot, you see, is, the reason I ask that question is it's a question I get asked a lot. 
Oh yeah, it's all very well. We can do we can do in situ coach development, you know, but we can do that in the sort of talent pathway or performance because we've got less coaches there. But when you go try to do it at scale, we just haven't got the capabilities. But they have because mm. they're spending a fortune on tutors to deliver courses. So what <laughs> if you re what if you sort of reappropriated that workforce to become more about? We're not going to do our tutoring in. We're not going to do our tutoring in these courses. What we're going to do is we're going to do the learning in the place where the coaches are yeah. now that changes the dynamics but the workforce exists it just needs to be kind of repurposed mm. it's where you put your value right like to me if we were to have to index the quality of a learning experience in a course that takes you away from everyone that you're working with away from the unique cultural and environmental constraints that you have to go back into and then give you these tasks that you think you can already do and were more than capable of doing before you left, but now can't do back in that environment because there is something different about having 11 year olds staring up at you while wondering what to do next and parents glaring from their cars and an allocated space in the nets that you have to use because somebody else told you to. So going out in the field feels impossible right now. Like there are so many things that are just, it's almost like we're adding just bricks on somebody's back and then we take them all off to do a course and then we put them back on again and say, now go and do the thing you just learned how to do. Why on earth would anybody want to carry around that bag of bricks? Like I would much rather stand next to them and carry those bricks for a night. So I remember what it feels like and then go, okay, if that is what you're dealing with in a context, what else can I do around that coach to make sure that load gets lighter? Because uh, the power of working in an organization isn't just the fact that I can show up in a polo shirt, is that I have an entire staff behind me who is looking at club development, who is looking at volunteer recognition, who is making sure that every diversity group feels catered to. Like our job isn't just that one person, but also to making the whole load way easier to carry. And so I think we miss that when we only do courses because we don't feel what those other environmental, social, like cultural constraints are that they deal with every day and can't tell us about because they don't know they're there until they hit them, until they want to try and change their behavior. And there is, there's not even have to be a tangible thing. Sometimes it's just the feeling of a coach looking at the back of your head. You're like, oh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go be adventurous today because that head coach is looking at me like I'm an idiot for being out on the field right now. Like any example that I use like that is something that I've felt in my coaching career. I've had parents turn on headlights behind nets that I've been coaching in, trying to make them fun by carrying a deck of cards at all times and making kids come up with their own games to try and you know make even the most dry coaching environment entertaining and because they disagreed with it they flashed their headlights at me so we immediately said the car was worth 100 points by all means go hit it like like come on why would anyone want to change their behavior with with teaching them something away from all of the things that are going to stop them from changing that behavior so to me like as much learning as you can do if it's 100 points for doing a course i'm sorry but anything that they learn in context is probably worth 200 so why would i waste my time when i can maximize my impact by just going to see that person um, and I think it's a very hard sell. It's still a hard sell. I'm still trying to work out what my KPIs are for this season so I can sell it to every you know version of management that I have to respond to. But to hear other people keen to do similar things, to hear staff be like, you mean I can go out there and do a workshop? Absolutely. Because you know exactly what they need because they're telling you, why not respond to that? I'm not going to hear it. Why make them say it twice? Go out mm. there and design the thing with them and we'll probably have a better learning environment that any course could give them anyway. I like this notion of a bag of bricks. That's, exact, <laughs> that's exactly what what we heard when listening to coaches was yeah. that the, the, the role, the demands and the burden of the role is increasing because the expectations mm. are higher. Um, the The actual capability you need to be able to manage young people nowadays where particularly with um you know got much much more young people with diagnosed behavioral difficulties who need to be catered for you can't just say no um and you know and all those sort of things so the, the skills required capabilities the dispositions the attitude the mindset 
are such that you know it's really and and not only that the compliance stuff you know the safe to practice not not decrying any of that it's important you know you need to you know need to do all that sort of stuff and i think there is a responsibility to provide some of the kind of the basic building blocks around working with different young people safeguarding um you know to help practitioners avoid inadvertently contravening you know the safe to practice construct mm. is is important um but yeah. that shouldn't be presented as a burden just another burden and this is the problem is is that whenever there's a challenge always oh, another training course to do and the training course is designed to alleviate the burden but in reality it's just another burden so the bag of bricks gets heavier because it's a different level of expectation i've learned this i must do that and so mm. the burden get, gets heavier and eventually people just get weighed down by it. And the problem is, is that the resources just don't keep pace. So the, the, role, the demands of the role increase, the resources don't keep pace and any resources provided actually just create more demands. And, and no doubt, you know, no surprise is it, people leave. And this is why we mm. talk about fixing the leaky bucket. People just decide, I'm disenchanted, I'm undervalued, I'm demotivated, I'm burnt out. I'm actually quite afraid. All these mm -hmm. emotions uh, come through and then people just decide, well, I'm just going to walk away from whatever the role is. And I've experienced that myself, walking away, having felt taken advantage of, you know, while the the club reaps the benefits of my voluntary free labor, you know, and is making thousands of pounds in membership fees and this, that and the other, investing very little into supporting coaches providing very little to provide coaches you know getting a, the days where a club thinks well we'll give you a hoodie you know and it's good enough right no 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 no. come on let's do it let's, let's think a little bit differently and recognize the skills involved um so you know so and i walk away you walk away eventually but no, i'm not doing it anymore because now you're just i feel like you're taking advantage you're not you're not providing you know any small act of recognition that makes such a difference but anyway the long story short is if organizations, sports organizations, would would like their uh, their kind of environment to be environments where people thrive, not just the participants, but also the practitioners, somewhere that's joyful, mm. has, you know, and is a great experience for everybody, then it's worth thinking about this in a different way. Because otherwise, eventually, people will begin to just, just walk away. And, you know, if you let, then end up having to just pay people to do the job. And that's fine. But all that does then is increase costs, which then pre prevents people from participating or whatever it might be. Or if you want to foot the bill, you can do that if you want to, you know. And you, But I've, I've done the maths on voluntary labor. If you take, say, England, where you've got approximately 1.7 million volunteers doing at least one hour a week of voluntary coaching if you were just to pay them minimum wage which over here is about 11 pounds 23 or something you know it adds up to something like you know 19 million pounds a week i mean if anybody wants to find 19 million pounds a week to pay these volunteers you can or you can support them a bit and they'll carry on doing the job with a great big smile on their face making everybody happy not that difficult to do this and I believe that the I'm trying to create a bit of a burning platform because I actually genuinely believe that community sport is at a bit of a crossroads and a bit of a knife edge where expectations mm -hmm. are rightly increasing. I don't think that's a problem. I think it's but like I've said in my own club environment, I don't believe that being able to run a community sports club entirely on voluntary labor is either moral or possible. Like, I think if I've got a lead coach with a lead coach responsibility, then I'm going to find a, a method of remuneration to recognize the role that they play. It then, it then means that you can have volunteers working under the lead coach because those volunteers, if they can't turn up, it doesn't mean the session won't run. But when you have somebody as a lead coach who then becomes, it says like, well, if you don't turn up, we can't run the session. They're not, they're not volunteers, they're unpaid workers. And mm. people who are unpaid workers after a particular point in time begin to start to question, hang on a second, why am I doing that? Most people do it through the love, the joy, the passion. I've got no problem with that. We always, we never, ever want to take that away. But in my particular context, I'm going to recognize those people by providing them with some form of remuneration. Now, it doesn't mean they're getting paid, 
we do a lot through what we call like an honorarium, right? It's just a recognition mm. that, you know, there's a piece of fun. Most people don't take it or they donate it to a foundation or a charity of their choice. Perfectly happy for them to do that. Um, entirely fine. But it's it's more the act of recognition that I, is, is the reason we've done it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we underestimate how much that means. And uh, we probably, instead of sharing the roles, like I, I've been thinking a lot more recently around, like, why do we only have one coach when we have mm. at least, and especially in a lot of our sports, team sports, where you probably have a, a minimum of like 11 kids, um, probably closer to 15 for, you know, if you want to get the, the right number of kids on the park. Um, a friend of mine in Cam, Cam Trudell actually does this perfect example of anytime you watch a press conference for a professional sport, they've probably got 20 other staff members that have briefed them on what they should say in the, in the presser. Um, they've got your head of, you know, strength and conditioning. You've got your physio. You've got multiple um, skill-specific coaches sometimes as well to train a professional sport of people. And you've got one person standing in the middle of the field of 12 kids who do not want to be there <laughs> because they've just had a bad day school and yet we expect the same level of performance from that yeah. one person in the middle of a field compared to an entire workforce who are very well paid in a professional context who said it had to be one person um mm. I was trying to think of ways in my first season of different ways that we can um see whether or not like there is an innovation in coaching uh, what does that look like if we actually go down to the system and have a look at it and to me, it was having more than one coach working on a team at the same time. It was, you know, like I would love the idea of having mini leadership teams that all do their own thing within a context, especially in a sport like cricket where game day is man management. It's not actually any sort of level of, you know, learning and development. It's a great opportunity to be like, whoa, we need to work on that at training next week. But other than that, it's very much just balancing it so that everybody has an equal opportunity on the morning and that is it. That could be a that could be a task that somebody does, that one yeah. person does. Okay, your job is just to make sure that when we do the team list this week, we've actually changed it up enough so that every person gets a fair go in the batting order. That is your task that you have. I need a task. I need someone to look after fielding this week because our fielding was terrible. <laughs> I need one person to come up with a, a fielding activity that we can do. And if you set it up over there, I'll do a batting activity. And now we've just distributed those roles over three people instead of one. Now, I yeah. think a lot of the reasons why people don't want to volunteer is because they are expected to do 50 million things in a season. But what if we didn't? Because as you were saying, you know, what if, you know, 11, no, 1 million people did one hour? It's never just an hour. And yeah, I wish not. it was just an hour, but it never is. But it could be. If you actually spread the load across more people, it could just be an hour over three or four people who are already going to be there anyway. Why don't we try to make it easier on each other? Why don't we spread the load a bit more? And it's just because a lot of these tasks they seem way too big because one person has traditionally taken them all on and now they're walking around with the bag of bricks. But you could easily redistribute those. And that acts as a, what you're talking about there is a good one. So that acts as a barrier again from people stepping forward because they believe they've got to have all of these things. So going back to your point about like people who are, say, non-cricket specialists thinking mm. that they can't play a role in coaching. You go, no, no, hang on, we've got a team. And that that person's got the cricket knowledge, so you've got that covered. What they haven't got is maybe the um, some of the uh, qualities whereby they can sort of tap into motivations of young people and understand more about some of their social emotional development. If we've got somebody who can do that, so that when, for example, inevitably somebody's you know got out for a golden duck or something, and they're crying because they're like ten and they're forced to play, you're out, you're out cricket still don't understand that but let's just let's leave that aside for one second thank you thankfully we don't anymore but yes <laughs> good, good okay yeah still goes on uh you know and you got like so when you've got a 10 year old crying their eyes out because basically their day's over and it's the end of the world and they're humiliated in front of all their friends there's someone who's going to put an arm around them and give them a and give them a whole you know a, you don't need any technical knowledge to do that and in actual fact sometimes having that kind of technical knowledge means you're only focused on the game and you're not focused on their well-being so actually if we could blend a series of skills together we're not going to, because in a community context with a volunteer, you're not going to find somebody with a whole package. But what you might do is mm. in the aggregate, put together four people or two or three people who blend their skills together and actually provide the entire package to everybody. 
Yeah. And I just don't think we see it. It's a, a been a big push lately is, you know, redefining vol- volunteering is something that it's like micro volunteering where you actually only have to do this yeah. one task. And I've really loved hearing that shift because yeah, I could do that. Like I don't, I don't really know the whole game of basketball, but I could do one activity and I could then have feedback on that activity and be like, great. Okay. Well, you leave that with me. I'll make that change over here. I'll keep these kids busy. You go do the thing that's like hyper-technical that they need to learn right now. I'm just going to go play the tag games. So I'm going to go make kids dribble with a tennis ball in their hand to actually get them to control the ball. That stuff I can do. I can do that in just about any sport nowadays because I've spent so much time across different sports but we just don't leverage that like I guarantee you there are people on those sidelines of every single training environment of every single sport who know way more than they think they do but have stopped themselves from stepping out on the field because they they don't have this perceived technical knowledge that you need as your entry ticket what if I told you that caring about kids is your entry ticket you are now officially a coach and even better you don't need to have those that knowledge because we have an entire application filled with activity ideas that you can go into <laughs> to actually find something to do if you don't know where to start. So even when we have these like much easier entry points, we're still too scared to step out of that space on the sideline of that peripheral space because nobody's invited them in. And that looks way too, I don't want to be the head coach. I don't want to have to deal with everything. I don't want to sit there and count five minutes. Okay, Johnny, you need to pad it up now because you're about to go into the net for five minutes. Five points, anybody's going to look for five minutes. I could stare out the window for five minutes and wonder where that five minutes went. Like that's, how am I going to learn anything in that time? Um, so yeah, we we have a lot of sort of perceived barriers just as anything else to make sure that we people actually feel like their knowledge and experience is valued regardless of the context that you're in. If you umpire in a different sport, great, come and umpire cricket because you've got the temperament that we need to deal with people who are yelling in your face. Thank you. Like, I can't do that. <laughs> So please come along, please do anything you want in every context. But yeah, we just don't really tap into it enough. It's interesting because um, like, like I think people don't sort of fully realize this. So there's an, an additional value in relation to what you're talking about here uh, to having this, I call it an in-situ, but it, let's talk it, let's sort of like a, you know, a context-led workforce. So you have a, whether it's you have staff or you have peer mentors based in your environment, the additional advantage of that is what I call the who me effect. So, mm. or the who me. <laughs> so this, so this is people who have no idea of their skills and qualities, and somebody spots it in them. You know, the kind of the people, people, and says, "You know what? You'd be, you'd make a really good coach." And they go, "Who me?" Because <laughs> they they didn't know. They their assumption of coach is like a very what everyone is technical knowledge generally speaking male generally speaking dominant personality generally speaking instructing that's their image of coach and when you say to them actually coach is this does this sound like you because you you have these qualities and we we'd love those qualities to be part of our coaching infrastructure and we've got some interesting research that we did with a couple of sports around this, this who me effect. And what it helped, it helped to diversify the workforce because particularly when it came mm. to women who didn't see themselves, they didn't see themselves as coaches because the image, then you were able to find people who had these qualities. Most famously is that it's actually netball. They were looking for coaches for a particular participation product that they'd created, which was called walking netball. So it was, targeting an older demographic um, and it was about engaging people in the sport and using that as a form of physical activity and health etc cetera, etc cetera. and they knew that they weren't going to look find the word coach really you know so coaches often are, are organizers of activities you know they create the experience for others without necessarily the sort of technical space you're still creating a space and um, they said well there's no way these people are going to resonate with the word coach so they created they created the term party host. So you have a walking netball party host. 
And the way they found them was they would watch a session happen and then wait to see the people who were there like, you know, half an hour, three quarters of an hour afterwards, still chatting to everybody, the social glue. And they'd say, you'd make a great party host. And then the rest would then snowball from there. So it's Ooh. interesting how these innovations in different kind of contexts based on the audience that you're engaging with and the qualities you need in an individual in order to engage that audience and then designing recruitment strategies and learning experiences for those individuals based off the context and how powerful that can be to support participation and growth and, and diversity as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always struggled with female-only coaching courses for mm. that reason um, mm. because I think it just reinforces the fact that you don't belong in a space where everybody else is learning how to coach. Like your context has to be uniquely different, even though every context and every coach in that room is actually different. You have to be in your own space away from everybody else. And it's always really annoyed me because when we do break it down to skills and characteristics, I did this in a workshop recently that I was a part of where we had to draw our ultimate cricket blast coordinator. So for us, cricket blast is similar to all stars. It's sort of five to 10 year olds. It's an entry level program for kids. Um, it's mostly game based, but you hide the skill learning in a lot of engaging activities. It's fun. It's loud. It's chaotic. And so the ultimate people in those spaces are often adaptable, great communicators, patient preschool teachers. <laughs> like Those are the kind of people that you want to run those contexts. And when we had to draw them, like actually physically draw a person, it's usually drawn as like a 20 year old woman, because those are the kind of people who are energetic enough to match the kids and can probably walk around with kids hanging off their legs if they wanted and be perfectly fine and still have the session going on flawlessly. But those aren't the people who are actually our coordinators in real life. If I were to drive around Perth and actually have a look at our Cricket Blast coordinators, we have so few who are actually that person. So somewhere along the way, we've miscommunicated the message of what makes a good facilitator in that, in that context, who our coordinators actually are. And so I said, great, well, I'm so glad we've all drawn this young woman. But now our only measure that matters is whether or not you actually see more people who look like that when you do your training, because you've communicated effectively that those are the skills and characteristics that make someone good at this role. And again, moving, we're trying to move away from roles where possible and try to see it as tasks. But even then, we don't really reach out to those people on the sidelines to say, hey, I think you'd be really good at this can you just go and like catch a ball with sam because uh she's like just really needs a friend right now and the other kids are annoying her like i don't even care if you know who that child is right now our job is to make sure everyone feels included so yeah i do find that when we break it down to, to skills and characteristics it's amazing how many people think of their um female mentors in their lives or you know people who have um had a positive influence in their sporting context in that area it's usually females yeah, I mean, something you said right at the start of that, which was about this idea of female-only coaching courses. So, um, firstly, courses. See? Like, if, if the only tool you've got is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? <laughs> yeah. The answer to every single issue is a course, right? <laughs> so I've got this mantra about, like, and I stole it from Harold Yarkey, who's a famous learning and development consultant. He talks about like what would you do anything anything but courses. If you couldn't do a course, <laughs> what what else would you do? So like you know, I do think if we could almost as a constraint on coach education, if you ban the notion of courses as a constraint, what other things would we create to support coaches? <laughs> it would be interesting, oh. wouldn't it? <laughs> my boss is going to hate me but yeah I, I will so one of the things I do have to do is uh, to find like an exploration KPI I love that I love we've gotten to the point where one of my things has to genuinely be to explore and I'm going to have a two-week period I reckon there's going to be a fortnight where we just run anything but courses um, and, and run well, with that idea and then just I, get people to brainstorm what I call this I call this the parable of the toxic fish so basically what happens with something like a female only course right i understand it right the idea is, is we're going to create a safe space 
and mm. it's going to be a place that might attract more individuals. We can talk about you, the unique issues faced, and you know we can mm. have a different kind of content. Understand that, right? So, yeah. But the yes, problem you've got yeah. with that is that you. So what you've got is you've got you've got this fish that's living in this polluted lake called community sport. Right, with all of the issues around sexism and misogyny and all the other bits and pieces that exist often in the community sports space, particularly in traditionally male dominated sports that have now obviously opened their doors but have still got a lot of that kind of embedded cultural stuff, not necessarily overt, but still there underneath, r- rippling away. So, um, and so you've got this sort of toxic lake and you take the fish out and you put it into lovely new fresh tank and it it gets better and it has a lovely experience and it's now really healthy and then you go right you're now really healthy fish come back into your toxic lake and what happens they die (laughs) or they get sick (laughs) so we're not dealing with the lake we're dealing with the fish in the lake so i've heard this used before by groups groups focused on the idea of women in coaching so you know focus groups that are or think tanks that are working around this space and one of the things they say often is we need to fix the system not the women and the assumption is that Mm -hmm. we need to do female coaching courses because there's something inherently um you know there's a defect in females which means they can't coach so we do these courses so that they can they can coach and they can come back and coach in the world but actually the reality is they're not there's not a defect there's a defect in the cultural fabric that means that mm. women often feel very unwelcome in those environments or at the very least not necessarily directly unwelcome but they feel um what's the word um they don't belong sense of belonging mm. And are always having to prove their worth, whereas their male counterparts don't have that uh, that same sense of responsibility. They're they're afforded a, a deference because of the fact because of their maleness, and presumably mm. also because of their experiences previously. So I, I mean I'm yeah. not I have I am obviously speaking third hand here because obviously I haven't had those experiences myself. But this is what you know. These are the things that have I've learned and learned through studying and working alongside these individuals and the things that they they say and it feels very real to me because actually i i've experienced those things myself but you know as a you know somebody who's male pale and stale i've still experienced you know when i've been coaching in environments that i'm not necessarily versed in experienced that level of automatic feeling of not belonging because you're not of of the of the system i've worked in sports where i don't belong in the sport because i haven't been rooted in the sport and i've i've been othered in those worlds so i totally i totally Mm -hmm. understand how that can feel for people Mm -hmm. i uh, I was pulling a face there because hockey was like one of those sports for me where i showed up and they were like what are you doing here you've never (laughs) played hockey before what on earth are you trying to do i don't know mate i bought a hockey stick off facebook marketplace I'm uh, wearing uh, normal shoes and football shin pads instead of hockey shin pads because I haven't decided if I like your sport enough to actually buy the kit. What's the worst that could happen? I make a fool of myself and it's not your problem. Like, just let me train, buddy. I think it's fine. And they're like, okay, but that's weird. Like, why on earth would you pick up this sport at like 27? I was like, why wouldn't you? It's a sport. It's Div 7. God, what am I going to do? Miss the ball between my legs? Wow, I've seen someone else do that five times in the warm-up and they've played hockey their whole lives. So I feel like I'm going to be okay <laughs> as long as I can trust the ball <laughs> right now. You're not setting the bar very high, buddy. But it, and sport is very much like that. They love to be like, unless you've been in this your whole life, you couldn't possibly understand the complexity of what we're trying to do here. Um, my complexity is I'm trying to make a six-year-old kid laugh with a cricket ball in his hand. <laughs> that is my objective here. I think you may be overcomplicated what we're trying to achieve, first of all. I was mm. I spent way too much time trying to pick what the color of the toxic lake should be, by the way, in my drawing. Because it's it, that's exactly it. And I think that is the same in, in every context. It doesn't matter which way you slice it. That is exactly what it feels like. We're taking people out of these toxic environments. We're pretending like we're helping them in this perfectly sterile world. And then we're throwing them back in there and be like, why didn't you change your behavior? You're now a bad coach because you did a level one coaching course, but you're not a better coach because you didn't change. 
why would they change? That you know, struggling for their lives right now in this toxic water. Um, I may have a presentation on Friday where I will absolutely use this analogy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I would be delighted for you to do so. Um, I've even got, a, I've even got a visual for you if you want one. I can share. Yes, please. <laughs> People are um, getting sick of my mind maps at work. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's funny though because it goes. This goes back to the sort of coach education is broken construct because this notion mm. of of courses as a mechanism for learning. So, like you'll know as well as I do. I think it was Ebbinghaus. You know, probably about what is it, sixty odd years ago, maybe longer that came up with the old forget, forgetting curve and the notion that, you know, you do these formal learning experiences where you condense learning into a very short time frame for efficiency's sake. Um, and the assumption being is all that knowledge is going to magically transfer into practice. Well, we know from our own kind of ecological understandings, you know, both been versed in, in that research, that um, transfer, skills transfer doesn't work like that anyway you know what's learning something out of context but secondly um so we use the an ineffective learning paradigm uh, as a mechanism to try and impart knowledge into a human being like it's going to put knowledge into you and it's the idea is is that knowledge is going to go in to the brain and magically transform into behavior in context Right. Well, so we know this is a flawed construct from the get go, but this is the idea that this is based upon and this is where it it's rooted, very, very rooted in a lot of educational paradigms. And we just recreate it for adults and expect different results. Right. So what we're not doing, we're not equipping people for the challenges they're going to face because we're using a paradigm that is perfectly designed to not do that and one of the reasons we do that use that paradigm is because we're driven by notions of compliance so we are given a kpi that we must verify an individual's competence at a moment in time so that that we can meet the demands that we need to meet in order to be able to service our sports right so we do it in the most efficient way possible at the expense of effectiveness now Problem again, so that, that so that in itself is a problem. The model and the paradigm is a problem, mm -hmm. but equal equal and and the secondary problem is that those individuals are then ill-equipped for the job. And like you say, you know, you said, you know, the job is make an eight or a ten-year-old laugh, you know, with a ball in the hand. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that, right? That's 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 the that's our goal here. But, it, you know, inherently there are some other complexities involved with the sport. But but the problem you got is, is that you're not going to cover off all those eventualities. And the reality is, is that because you're in a time constrained environment, you know, whether it's a weekend or it's two weekends or have. And of course, the longer you make it, the more the more it becomes a barrier, the more it becomes a burden. So you, you, you're forced by the fact that people have got limited time nowadays, that you've got to do things in this compressed time window. We package it all together. We do it as quickly as possible. And you can't cover off all the eventualities. So then you leave people to go into the wilderness. And they're just like, whoa, my God. And it's like, you know, and they're, they're stumbling into all sorts of different pitfalls. And they don't know how to handle it. They make loads of mistakes. They find it really difficult. They're really Now, of course, you can put a guide by the side as well to help them through that journey. And then that's definitely the most powerful learning model. And then you can re then you can re-examine that later. You can engage them afterwards and make sure that they're developing on the journey and you can give them sort of accreditation as they go. So there's no longer this notion of CPD, I, I go on a course, I attend a course, I get rewarded for my attendance and off we go from that. You know, CPD is actually just a recognition of the things that you're experiencing and your ability to reflect upon them positively with another. Actually, brilliant. Like you've learned something huge there. You had a really terrible experience that you've managed to sort of make sense of. And now you're going to do something differently going forward. Oh, look how your behavior has changed from like three months ago when you were really struggling in this space. And now you're engaging with questions. It's really changed, hasn't it? It's really changed the environment that you're operating within. Somebody else recognizing that, even though you may, do, may not even know you're doing it yourself. Or somebody coming along and saying, oh, by the way, I noticed you were doing this over here. Did you see yourself doing that? No, that's an amazing thing that you've done there. Or did you notice that time that you were there and you were talking to that individual for quite a long time? And you notice how the other people started to disengage? No, I didn't see that. So it's being the eyes and ears around someone. It's 
so powerful. It's so enormously supportive. So this flipping of the script a little bit, it doesn't necessarily have to be entirely let's get, throw the baby out the bathwater to get rid of this notion of a coach, but just recognize its role. It, we're asking qualifications and coach education to carry too much water. And what we're now saying is, is actually, let's just recognize that it's part of, it could be, it doesn't have to be, but it, it could be part of a learning experience, but it's a small part. It's about mm. some basic stuff to give you a learning experience to begin with, but it's it's a very, very small part of an overall learning journey. And the learning journey is what you then go on to do and you go on to continue to do as, as on, on an ongoing basis. Mm. Yeah, and I think we can still take elements of those and put them back in those formal education environments, right? Like I'd like to think that a lot of the time we spend, you know, the first 30 minutes of a session is actually just asking people the kind of coach that they want to be. Um, what does, what, if someone was to drive past your training session right now, what do you hope they would see when you are there at training and we do a drive by? Um, we also ask about the reasons why they get into coaching. Why were you the last person to step back? We all know you're voluntold to be here and that's perfectly fine. Own that. Like why have you accepted that role now instead of just you know trying to palm it off onto someone else because somewhere deep down you said you know what I can I can do this or I need to do this for the sake of other people great I can leverage that within this environment and speak to that but ultimately I think one of my favorite things that we did last season was um, we tried to get realistic challenges going so we would ask people hey here is a particular skill we know that a lot of people spend time in this space I want you to come up with a problem that you have at training around this skill and the activity that you would use to try and address that and then we'll co-design what we can do in that moment if we notice that something's missing if maybe we have someone who's difficult or different or has a different set of needs can we cater for all of those people within this awesome activity that you're already doing so we start with that validation of your ability to design an activity by showing us what you do in your own context and then we can work through those activities together so that you have the confidence and competence to actually change them when something doesn't work and I, like as that's I think that's the best that we can do in a formal education space but it's so much better than just being like here are our best case scenarios here is the best practice activities this is what you should be doing unless someone asks us for those we, we've got them ready but we're not going to set them out unless we have to the only ones we do are for the, the difficult skills like you know wiki keeping or spin bowling which people don't even know where to start in terms of asking a question so we try to make the barrier to entry as low as possible here let's just see how many times we can make this ball spin here let's try and wrap it around a cone or something um, to make it seem less intimidating in that space when we do have them but I do love the idea of if we are going to move away from these spaces um, where we have a, an over-reliance, I guess, on the formal elements, um, that we don't lose the social elements of them too. Like to me, that's um, something that we need to recreate in different contexts and get people you know, working together. And something I picked up recently from this amazing um, week that I spent in New Zealand with their cricket people was I coach, we coach, you coach. Um, this idea that when you are on site with a coach, um, if they are really struggling, you can step in and make an adjustment as a coach developer and then step back out and reflect on that process, right? I can coach for you in that second. Um, but ultimately, we coach together. We are now working on this problem together so you don't have to do it alone. And then we'll get to the point where, you know, you go coach and you come tell me about it. Uh, you don't need me there in that context as much as you did before. What if our coach development was exactly the same? It, the iCoach is a workshop for a very technical thing that a lot of people want to know about. The we coach is actually going into those social learning spaces. But you know what? We're going to add kids this time. We're going to get a team down. We're going to do something so it does feel like we're really coaching together. Not that you're coming to me for help even though that's what traditionally a course is. And then the you coach is that site visit. Can we follow up with you? Can we follow your journey? Can we keep that touch point? Can we send somebody else out there? Can we ask your club how you're doing so that you are coaching out there, but you're not doing it by yourself. You are now the lead of this journey, not us. Um, I, like that's something that I, I hadn't connected those two pieces until we had this conversation. Well, well, and we that that facilitated that connection. <laughs> I'll be a little city chair in the bottom corner of my plan for the season. <laughs> Perfect. Um, 
So can you believe we've been going at this for nearly 90 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the time thinking, who's going to listen this far? <laughs> Oh, you'd be surprised. Those people who make uh, journeys across countries that last five days, they need stuff to listen to, right? <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> we ran out of albums very quickly. <laughs> you can imagine. Start arguing about what you're going to play next. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, I've, um, I, I, I'm glad we could reconnect. Um, uh, it's been too long. I'd like to keep the momentum of this and keep, keep, keep these conversations going. Um, it's great to hear that you know you're kind of at the coal face now of um obviously taking some of the things that you've studied and learned and now placing that into how you can support others to have gleeful experiences because let's face it we talk a lot about the difficulties and demands and everything else but largely speaking and for the most part coaching is a pretty joyful experience you know i miss mm. a lot of my friday evenings on the cricket field and i i you know, I've stepped away because, I, you know, it was the right thing for me at the time for my own well-being. But I do miss it. It was a big part of my social life. It was a big part of, you know, my children's upbringing. And I used to love those days when, you know, we'd finished the coaching session and, you know, having a beer and watching the kids all play on the park. And, you know, they're doing the proper skill development there, aren't they? They're really like inventing yeah. their own games and things. I really miss it. And it is a genuinely joyful experience. And I you know, always want to provide the, the support that we possibly can. So the reason for the shift, I suppose, and the reason for this sort of, you know, kind of reconceptualization of Coach Ed is because, you know, we should value those people who are prepared to put their hands up and do this and not just expect that, oh, well, we'll get someone else. Someone else will come along. Someone else will come along. Anyone's as good as anyone else. I just don't, I think we really need to rethink that construct. Yeah, and I, I I look forward to like now that this is my my second season at it. Uh, we spent so much time talking to as many people as we could get our hands on and say, "What do you want from the season?" And I mean that quite genuinely. I'm not saying it because I'm I'm here to be like, "Great, well, I'm going to go against that." No, I I would rather do absolutely none of what we did last season if none of it suited anybody in this space. Um, and, but we don't have that level of feedback yet, so we are very much running on both. We are we're running on the fumes of the the few sources of research and education that we have in a community space but primarily we're just trying to put the loudspeaker in the hands of the people who need this stuff the most and I want to make your life easier I don't want to add to that bag of bricks that's the only version of education that matters in community sport I think awesome great to chat to you um I've really enjoyed this conversation um all the best (laughs) and then when you've got through your season which you're obviously just about to get, get get ramped up into uh maybe we can reconvene and you can reflect on the learnings and then we can create our own little mutual support society well we've got to start somewhere maybe if uh <laughs> if other people listen they'll start their own yeah indeed uh alex great to chat to you and all the best thank you very much